Hey there, Julian from Memberstack here, and in this video I want to talk about how I built a SaaS using almost completely no-code tools thanks to Memberstack and Wiz together. So, unfortunately in this video I cannot break down a step-by-step -step of exactly everything that was done because, well, a lot was done, and it's pretty hard to explain. That being said, I want to go over the process that was followed, the things that I kept in mind, the tools that I used, being a non-developer myself in order to build this and make everything work. So anyways, with that being said, let's get into it. First things first, I want to talk about what was built. So our idea was to build a tool which can detect rage clicks and then do something about it. So either opening a custom Webflow UI or opening a live chat on your website if, if you have a live chat. And that was it. That was the entire idea. That was what we wanted to build. So that was what I started with. And after that, I got into some other things that I wanted to try. As you can see here, rage clicks are tracked. It shows the pages and some other features like domain control. Some other stuff was just added along the way to kind of enhance the product, enhance the user experience. But in essence, this was the goal. This is what we were trying to build. So the most important thing that I want to mention about this and how this was built is chat GPT, because like I said, I am not a developer. I have gotten more familiar with code, more familiar with developing things, more familiar with products over time, but I have never actually learned how to code. Um, so you watching this, if you're in the same boat as me, the good news is you can probably also build a SaaS. Now, when it comes to ChatGPT, there's something very important to talk about because no, you cannot just open up ChatGPT and boom, you're a developer, you can do anything that you want. There are certain ways that you need to interact with it in order to use it correctly. And what I'm gonna pull open for you right here is my conversation from the start with ChatGPT that I was using the entire time this thing was built. And what you're gonna notice is that it is all very condensed as in, Typically, there's not going to be some long, long, long prompts explaining everything. It's usually very simple. That is because I find that ChatGPT gets very confused once you start to go and give it very long, complicated instructions, send it a whole bunch of different stuff. The best thing to do is to keep it condensed. For example, let's say you want to build a SaaS with for this, with rage clicks. You want to be able to detect rage clicks, you want to be able to track them, you want to be able to show them, you want to be able to open live chats, custom Webflow UIs. Well, don't tell ChatGPT that all in one go. You're going to want to break it down into the simple stuff, the core of the platform, and then go from there. So as you can see here, I'm trying to make a SaaS based on a JavaScript snippet. Basically, people make an account, configure it, paste it, and it will work in their own settings. So I'm not even telling it what I'm trying to do here just giving it a brief explanation so that it can break things down for me. And that is the next thing that I wanna say regarding ChatGPT, is you are not going to just want to use it to write code for you 100%. You are going to want to use it to learn. And yes, if you're like me and your syntax knowledge is not very good, you're gonna put a semicolon where a colon should be, so on and so forth, it can fix that for you. You just send it a bit of code that you know there's an issue with and you say, what's wrong? it'll fix it and send it back to you. But over time, while you're building this, you are going to need to get more familiar with your own environment, where everything is, what functions are doing what, so on and so forth. So just to kind of scroll through this conversation, as you can see here, I'm usually asking very simple things and making suggestions and letting ChatGPT tell me what it is that I need to do. And finally, something very important that I wanna talk about with ChatGPT is you need to make it aware of everything that it is that you know. If you go to it and say, this isn't working, maybe it'll figure it out, maybe it won't. But if you can look and figure out what the problem is and then send it to it, it will find a solution. For example, open up your console, look at the console logs, and send it those errors. Make it as aware as you are, and it will be able to help you. If you don't, then it's just going to be a really, really, really frustrating time. So the next thing that I want to talk about is actually getting started in the process of building this. And the first thing that was done was a script 
was created. So I used ChatGPT to generate a script which just did the job, but it was not configurable. It was not a hosted script. It was just a piece of JavaScript that when you clicked it more than five times in a second, it popped open this item that you define in the script. So that was the first thing. That was just to make a prototype of what is this? What can this do? Can this work with JavaScript? Which almost always going to be yes, the answer to that. And that was the first thing. So from there, you can see it working. You'll immediately notice some issues with it. Notice some things that maybe you can add, some things that you should remove. And that is the best way to get started. And just go ahead and try that out on your own site. So after I had that working prototype script, the next thing that I did was I figured out what am I going to need to use to power this? And I got that set up. So first things first, I was looking and saying, well, I need somewhere for my users to log in. So I use MemberStack for that. I need somewhere to store data about their selections, what it is that they want, Supabase for that. I need somewhere to serve this script from because, well, you can't just place it on their site. It needs to send some sort of a request. And all of this stuff I learned just through ChatGPT, through failure, through trying, through testing. And for that, I realized, okay, I can serve this through Vercel. So I got platform set up on all of those. Along with that, I set up a GitHub repository, and that was where all of my stuff went into. And if you are like me a few weeks ago, you're probably thinking that's really confusing. That all sounds way over my head. Just do it. Just go get started, and when you run into any sort of issue, break it down for ChatGPT, be simple, say what the issue is, and then it will help you overcome it. And another thing that I want to mention is to keep backups the whole time, because if you're in my shoes, you're just doing a lot of testing and trying to figure everything out, but you're going to make mistakes. So make sure that you save a lot of backups. So if we go over here, just to kind of walk through the architecture of how everything looks, we have this GitHub repository. And within here, we have the scripts that we need. So one is we have a folder here to sync member stack with Supabase. And I also have a video on that. I will link it in the description if you want to know how to do that. And then we have the other scripts in here that are going on. So this one right here is what is used to actually make this work. What is going to pop it open? What is going to create the script? And we have this, and this is all served and used with Vercel over here. And Vercel is basically, there's probably a much better way to describe it than what I'm going to use, but it is something that you can serve your code in. So this is where I'm serving that script that works, which I will show you in just a sec. For data, we are using Supabase, as I said, and in here we've got our different tables. We have it synced up with member stack. We have our selection. So every time a rage click is detected, it gets logged into here. All of this is done using code made with ChatGPT served through Vercel. And again, all of this stuff was figured out using ChatGPT. So along with that, we have member stack here. And this is what we use to manage our users, to accept payments, to integrate with Stripe. And this is basically the brain of our business. And Member stack is super easy to set up. And then the question just becomes, how is it going to play into your overall system? For example, do you just want to use member stack? Do you need something like Supabase? Do you need to store data? And in this case we did, but you may not depending on your situation. So let's take a look at this right now. We have somewhere to store our data. We have somewhere to serve our code. We have somewhere for our users to log in, authenticate themselves, pay, so on and so forth. Now the question just becomes, how do we get data from the user into our database so that it can be stored? And that is where WISD comes into play. So here we are in our WISD project here for all the rage. And there are about 90 something actions, requests, so on and so forth. And this is the first product that I've actually built using WISD, and I have to say I absolutely love it. 
It is confusing at the start. There is a learning curve. You're not going to know what to do. You're not going to know how anything works. My recommendation is to just get started and build some sort of test project with the four operations crud, whatever they're called. A real developer would probably know this better than I would. Um, but test out all of the basics. So test out creating something from Wiz. Test out getting some item from Wiz. Test out updating an item from Wiz. Test out deleting an item from Wiz. If you do that in a test project, you will very, very quickly understand what this is, how powerful it is, and how it works. So this is what we're using entirely to communicate between our front end, our user, and our database. So if I go over here, for example, then what we have here, this is through WISD communicating to member stack the user's information, getting that into there. And then after that, they are taken to a page to set their preferences right over here. They can decide their domain, what they want to open, their type, their frequency, so on and so forth. And this, I'm going to give you an example. If in here, we have set up a request called, let's see, uh, create selection. So this one right here, what we're doing. And first, let me just explain very briefly the difference between requests and actions and what they are. I'm also going to make a much more complicated, much more thorough video on that exact concept. But just for the sake of this video, a request is anything that you're using to either send data to or get data from another app. Whereas an action is something that happens within your app. So if you're trying to take something, manipulate it, and show it to the user, that's an action. If you're trying to get something from member stack, get something from Supabase, add something to Supabase, that is a request. And you use actions to trigger requests, which I'll show you in a second. But here we have this request. And basically, we are just submitting this form. We want to create an item in our selections table. We have the ID and then all of this stuff. And something that confused me, and I'm sure confuses a lot of people at the start when you're using WISD, is the way that these bits here work. How it says return r dot get all this stuff. Looks a bit scary for someone who doesn't code too much. Um, but it's really not. It's really not. You get used to it super quick. Return just means this is what I'm trying to send. This is what I'm trying to show this is what's going to come back. So in this case, return this member ID. I'm not logged in, so it's not going to work. But you can get all of that stuff, all of these variables from here. And like I said, once you try with a test project, you're going to quickly get the hang of it. It's just a bit scary at the start. But anyways, we have our request here to create our selections. And then when someone fills out that form, we have an action to trigger it. And as you can see here, on event, when this form is submitted, we are creating our selections and triggering that request. So there's a lot, and unfortunately, I can't explain absolutely everything that was done here in WISD. As you can see, there's a whole, whole, whole bunch. But that is just one example of how you can use WISD to communicate from your user to your data store, whatever it is that you need to communicate. So here we are at this point. We have an app. We have everything that we need, somewhere to serve our code from, somewhere for people to log in. We have our front end here, which is Webflow using WISD. Our customers can communicate with, their, with our data storage to update their preferences and do everything they need to do. We have a finished SaaS right here. The next thing that we need to do is actually get it ready to sell. So obviously, whatever it is that you're going to do, how you're going to sell your product totally depends on what makes sense to you, what fits the product, what competitors are doing, so on and so forth. But in our decision, we decided that it would be perfectly fine to just sell this as a one-time fee of $20 and you get access to the platform forever because, well, this doesn't cost us very much money to run at all. So because of that, it works perfectly fine. If yours does cost you a lot of money, then obviously your pricing model is going to need to reflect that. But here we have this and we set up the pricing in member stack over here. As you can see, we set up a plan and then we use WISD to add that plan to the member. So if I can go ahead and find that in WISD right over here, I believe it is a, there we go. So right here, 
adding that plan with that plan ID from MemberStack to the member, it goes ahead and opens Stripe checkout. And the last thing that we needed to do was to build a marketing site. And with a marketing site, you know, we don't want to go too crazy. We built this whole app quickly using these super snappy, powerful, low-code, no-code tools. And we want to keep that same thing going with our homepage. So as you can see over here, we used, if you use it, you may already know, we used Reloom in order to build this. And Reloom is an amazing, amazing product, especially if you don't have a set design to work with. Still great if you do, but if you don't, this whole page can be built very, very, very quickly. I would say it took about 15 minutes to build this page and then, you know, another hour and a half, two hours, just tweaking it, making it a little bit nicer, writing the copy, so on and so forth. So that is it. That is, in a nutshell, the whole process from start to finish that I followed while building this SaaS using MemberStack, Wizd, Webflow, Supabase, Vercel, and GitHub. And it was a whole lot of fun and it really amazed me to see the kind of things that are now possible using these tools. I'm really excited to build more. I'm really excited to make more detailed tutorials for you on how you can also build more. I will talk to you soon and have a great day.